good morning good afternoon and good evening everyone uh, depending on from where you have joined uh, welcome to another webinar by data platform geeks my name is rohit and i will be your host for today and our today's speaker is matt gordon who is an mvp from usa and he will be taking a session on where should my data live and why i have satya ramesh with me who will help us with the moderation of today's webinar and the q and a Uh, so eDominant Systems, many of you may already know about eDominant. We have a couple of brands under it. Uh, Expand ERP, uh, which is an award-winning ERP solution that eDominant has developed from scratch. And uh, Data Platform Geeks, of which you all are members of. Uh, we have a lot of free events that we do under it. And uh, of course, our annual summit, that is Data Platform Summit, uh, which we concluded in August uh, this year. I will speak about it uh, in some time. And we then have SQL Maestros where we offer a lot of uh, advanced SQL trainings and we have hands-on labs which are self-paced online trainings and then the learning kits by SQL Maestros. And under PeopleWare India, we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of corporate training unit. It's, it's basically a corporate training unit. So Data Platform Summit 2018, like I said earlier, we concluded it in August. It was a three-day conference from nine to 11. And we had two days of uh, pre-con classes, which are full day classroom trainings on 7th and 8th. This time, uh, the, uh, the summit happened at Radisson Blue, which, will, which is a five-star property. And as you can see here, the summit was a huge success. We had participation of more than 900 people coming, from, coming in from 300 plus companies and uh, 16 countries. So, uh, DPS 2019, we have already started working towards it. Uh, the dates are announced. It will be a three-day conference again from on August 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And this time, we will be having three days of pre-con. So that is on August 19th, 20th, and 21st. Uh, one of the main reasons why our uh, summit is such a huge success is because it is 100% learning and 0% marketing. So if you wish to visit our website, uh, www.dps10.com, that is our official website and any queries can go to contact at dps10.com. So why should you really care? Uh, so like I said earlier, uh, uh, there's a lot of deep technical content by world's best trainers. We have a lot of support from Microsoft Redmond. The product makers come down to Bangalore to deliver these uh, advanced trainings. And uh, what's more, you get to reskill and upskill. And the networking, like I said, there are more than there were 900 more than 900 participants last uh, summit. So this is everything is under one roof basically. So it's a huge networking opportunity for you, and you can make connections for life. And we have the world's best infrastructure at uh, Radisson Blue. And uh, DPS involves the community. Something that we take pride in is that uh, every session that you see at the summit has been decided by the audience. We put up all our sessions for voting and the best, uh, the ones that this, uh, people want to see at the summit are the ones that we choose. The content is highly curated. So DPS 2019 pre-registration has already started. So you can go to, you can visit our official website and you can pre-register now. So pre-registration, you don't have to pay anything to pre-register. It is absolutely free. And uh, moreover, you will be getting a discount code by the end of January. Uh, Jan uh, we will be officially launching DPS 2019 in, uh, in the month of Jan. So that's when you will get the discount code as well. So uh, go ahead, show your interest so, and pre-register now. Uh, and the next steps, so go ahead and evaluate Data Platform Summit. We have four editions, 2015, 16, 17, and 18. All our uh, sessions that were delivered in each of the summits and the kind of speakers that had come down to take those sessions, the keynotes, everything is up on our website. Uh, visit our uh, official site, that is, again, dps10.com. The DPG core team, uh, Amit Bansal, the founder and president, uh, Manoho Puna, the vice president, Avnish Panchal, Sandeep Pani, Prince Rastogi, and Surbhi Agarwal are regional mentors. Uh, our newest member is Vijay Mishra, who is also a regional mentor. Uh, these are the e-dominant teams across India. We have uh, branches in Kolkata and Bangalore. Uh, this was at the summit earlier this year. Uh, and that on the stage, you can see the DPG core team and the e-dominant teams and Amit Bansal. Special thanks to Microsoft for supporting us in our community initiatives. And uh, 
data platform geeks community uh, now you all are part of it so go ahead and access all the free content that we have we have recorded webinars that we upload uh, on our website and as well as on our uh, youtube channels and all the material that all the free when material so you can go ahead and access all of them if you have any questions you can join the largest sql group on facebook and our linkedin group and our telegram group on mobile as well such i will put them down shortly all the links you can go ahead and join them uh, like I mentioned, all our uh, DPG webinars are recorded, and you can uh, find them on YouTube. Uh, that is our uh, uh, that is our channel, YouTube uh, slash SQL Server Geeks, and all our uh, SQL Server internals and performance tuning videos are on uh, YouTube.com slash SQL Maestros. So, without any further delay, let's get started with the webinar and welcome Matt Gordon, our today's speaker. And uh, if you all have any questions, you can please use the Q&A panel to ask the questions and Matt will answer them once the webinar is over. Over to you, Matt. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Matt, I can hear you. Excellent. Okay. All right. So there, there is one part of this that I'm hoping will be a little... Uh, Kind of like a poll. Um, so if people want to uh, want to answer that, I guess in the chat window, we can do that, and then we'll hold all all the actual questions to the end, like you said. Okay. So, like you said, the topic for today is where should my data live and why. Uh, here's a little bit about me. I'm a data platform solution architect for a company called. DMI. Um, we're headquartered out of the USA, um, but we actually have three offices in India as well uh, and beyond our data platform team. Uh, we also do app dev and full stack development as well. Um, my Twitter handle is SQL at speed, and that's the website for my blog as well. Here's a little bit more about me. Um, I was actually awarded my MVP back in September. So really excited about that. Uh, that that's that been very, very cool. Um, I've been working with SQL Server about 17 years, um, and, I, and I've come at it from all angles. Um, I've been in database dev, DBA. I've managed teams, managed data centers. Um, so a lot of the issues we're, we're going to talk about, I've approached from more than one angle. Um, I've been fortunate enough to speak the last two past summits, uh, and I also run a past local group as well. Uh, you might have wondered how I picked my Twitter handle and website, and even if you didn't, I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. Um, occasionally, I like to drive race cars, so here are the, here are the two that I've driven in, in the last year or so. Um, so if, if you don't think the talk was very good but want to talk to me about driving race cars, uh, feel free to contact me, Twitter, email, whatever, uh, and I'll put all that information up at the end. So here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to start with where does our data live now? Uh, and then we're going to work through to why does our data live where it does? Um, I have a brief section on GDPR kind of thoughts and impacts. There's nothing in this talk that has anything to do with recommending one cloud vendor over another or anything like that. That particular section, though, I do kind of have some thoughts on what vendor is easier to deal with uh, for some of the tooling around GDPR. Uh, once we get through that, then we'll talk about, you know, does it make sense for things to be in the cloud, on-prem, or both? Um, we'll follow that up with some case studies, uh, some things that I've done hands-on um, to just kind of talk about, you know, maybe some things to kind of break the mold of, you know, why are we putting our, you know, certain things in the cloud or on-prem, uh, and then we'll wrap it up from there. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take those throughout, but go ahead and put them in the Q&A panel, uh, and we'll queue all those up for the very end. Okay. So before we get started, I'm assuming most of us here are familiar with a chart like this. Um, generally, you've either seen this version or there's a version that goes around that talks about pizza as a service uh, that 
portrays the same thing. It's probably a little more fun. Uh, but here in the States, it's a little early for pizza. Uh, so I've gone with kind of a boring chart. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully you can see my mouse arrow move. Um, but yeah, when we talk about running this stuff on prem, we manage the entire stack. Uh, you know, your your bare metal all the way up through your data and apps. Uh, when we talk about infrastructure as a service or IaaS, um, we're managing from the operating system up. So we have nothing to do with with the bare metal, uh, but we are installing the OS, configuring it, and managing everything above that. Uh, in this talk, we'll also talk about platform as a service as well, or PaaS. Um, and for that, we're only managing data and apps. Everything below that, OS, middleware, bare metal, networking, storage, um, is a bit of a mystery to us. It's just, it's there, it works, but we don't have to manage it. We don't have to configure it or do anything like that. Uh, just for the full chart to make sense, there's software as a service over here on, on the right. Um, we won't talk about anything SaaS in this talk, uh, but just so there's kind of continuity here, um, I wanted everybody to be on, on the same page and in the way of terms and things like that. Okay, so what are some discussion points we can hit on? And just kind of keep these in your mind as, as we go through this talk. So first of all, the cloud is not magic. It can do some very cool stuff. Um, there are some things that kind of appear magical, but in reality, what it is, it's just computers that belong to somebody else in a data center that belongs to somebody else. That's all it is. Um, you know, there are some things obviously that have been done in the way of tooling and scale and things like that. They're very, very cool, uh, um, but it's not magic. They really are just computers somewhere else. Uh, like we'll talk about the major cloud providers and even minor ones too, um, they're constantly expanding the options that they offer to us. So in a way, this is very good for us. Uh, it's, you know, we're constantly being given new, new solutions um, to fix issues that we have, uh, but it's important to stay abreast of those because they do change frequently. One thing I, I kind of want to hit on throughout this talk is, are we locked into deployment locations for certain platforms? So I've got a couple examples here, but you know, are we putting things someplace because we've always done it? Like, well, we always deploy database servers on-prem, so we're gonna keep doing that. Or if we have a Hadoop cluster, we always spin it up in, in the cloud. Um, you know, are there are there good reasons for that, or is that a is that a habit that we need to break? Lastly, um, you know, blending these technologies, platforms, and even cloud providers may or may not be the right answer. Um, obviously, any salesperson you have from any of the major providers is going to tell you that all your stuff needs to run on theirs because it never goes down. It has you know so so many nines, um, blah blah blah. You know, but we need to think through the problems we're trying to solve um, and make the best decision for our data and our company uh, and, and, and not be too, too concerned with the sales pitches here. So where does our data live now? So here's the part that's somewhat interactive. And if you want to answer in, in the chat, that works. So I'm curious, is there anybody, and you can just answer yes, um, that has no data environment in the cloud at all? That's just kind of here for this talk, just to kind of learn about their options, but they're not able to put anything anywhere other than on-prem. Okay. Um, are, is there anybody who does have some stuff out in the cloud, but it's just uh, test dev and QA, nothing production or production-like? Okay, and I do see some answers coming through in the chat. Thank you. Um, is there anybody who does have something out in the cloud, but just one production app maybe as a, as a trial? Okay, 
Uh, and I think I saw this. Um, is there anybody who has all their production data environments cloud only? And look like in the chat, there's at least one person that that did. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So I'll I'll say this. Uh, this is the probably the best mix of answers that I've gotten when I asked this, and it's been fascinating. You know, I've probably been giving this talk a little over a year, um, and it's obviously changed every time I've done it. But it's really it, interesting to see how the answers have changed in about 14 months. Um, you know, a lot even even a year ago when I'd ask uh, if anybody had anything out in in the cloud, uh, very few hands went up, and that you know, just about every month that has changed. So, very cool. Okay. So why does our data live where it does? So I'm going to go through some pros and cons, either that I've seen or um, that I've had customers kind of argue with me over th the years. Um, you can debate these points and, and actually feel free to do that. If you want to throw something in, in the chat, that's fine. Uh, if you want to hold it as a question to the end, that's fine too. Um, this is just kind of some things that I've seen that make sense to me, um, but obviously this talk gets better with feedback. So if you think maybe I've I've missed some points here, uh, definitely happy to t take a pause and chat about those. So what are some pros of being on-prem? So you see this first sub-bullet here it talks about leveraging investments. Um, the reason that's in quotes is because this this is basically something that I that I was told. Um, so this doesn't relate precisely to cloud versus on-prem, but the next story I'm going to tell kind of helps you think as we talk to managers about how we want to deploy certain things, obviously we need to go get budget for this. Um, and so part of what I want to do with this talk is give you a little insight into maybe how managers think through what we're asking about. You know, we're coming at it from a more technical standpoint. They're not. They're coming at it from dollars and cents, usually. Um, and so I was actually given this phrase. It was a company that I used to work for. And this is probably three years ago. Uh, their storage vendor came to them. You know, they had a very large spinning disk SAN. And their storage vendor came to them and said, you know, the time is right. We'd like to upgrade you to our all flash, you know, storage. And we're going to offer you a trade-in of X dollars for that. So you trade it in your old spinning disk SAN. We're going to give you all flash. Um, and, you know, it's going to cost whatever it was going to cost. So we evaluated that on the technical side and, and agreed that the time was right for it. And, you know, sent that up the chain. And the answer that came back to us was, basically that you know they had owned that sand for going on roughly four years <clears throat> and they they did they wanted to continue quote unquote leveraging the investments they had made in it so we talk about you know the pro of on-prem being being cost to a certain extent when i say that what i'm saying is that management will see their investment in the on-prem data center and rather than considering it a sunk cost, they will consider it as kind of an active investment that they should continue making. Uh, so when we come to them and say, listen, you know, we think a lot of things should move to the cloud now or not, their perspective on that is going to be, well, we spent all this money on this on-prem data center. What about that? Uh, and so that's something I do kind of want you to keep in mind to these next few slides is that from a purely technical standpoint, you know, perhaps putting a lot of things in the cloud is right, but the people we're discussing this with and the people that need to sign those checks may not think so, and they may not think so, you know, for a completely non-technical reason. So going back to the point of cost, if uptime is not critical, uh, to a certain extent, you know, putting something on-prem can cost less. If you're not worrying about HA, DR, any of that, really all you need to do is maybe rack a server and that's it. Um, that can be quite cheap. If you already have, have the infrastructure in place, you know, potentially it may make more sense to buy a few hundred dollar server and put it in and, and do whatever you're going to do with it uh, rather than spinning anything up 
in the cloud. The next point, uh, or the next sub bullet is, is also in quotes because it's, it's another thing I was told. So there's a certain comfort level, especially with executives that comes when they can say, I can go see what I'm paying for. You know, if they, if, if everything's deployed to Azure or Amazon or something like that, you know, an executive can't go down the hall to their server room and badge in or look through the window or whatever uh, and see it. You know, they know they're paying for it. Um, but if it's in the cloud, you know, it's not something that they can go see. So again, this can be a pro, especially from a management perspective, um, it may make them comfortable to say, yeah, I can go down the hall and see that. And I know what I'm paying for. I can look in that window and see all, all the lights blink. And I like that. That if we put things out in the cloud, I can't do that. So that's, that's a possible pro and definitely <clears throat> kind of a mindset we need to think about as we start the conversation about deploying things certain places. Uh, the next point is fiscal control and security. And so this, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a great story here. So this does not minimize how important this is. And in fact, I have customers in the financial world where their SOWs to their clients require them to be in physical control of servers. So they, there are certain things they cannot do put in the cloud at all. It's required to be, you know, in a site owned by them, managed by resources that work for them. So this is not to minimize that at all. Um, it's, it's kind of a broader point where, you know, I worked with a company once where they said, listen, I don't trust putting anything out in the cloud because I don't know anything about their security practices. Um, I don't know how they control their servers. You know, I don't know, is it guarded by one person, 10 people, whatever. You know, what I do know is I've just built this data center on on prem and it's very safe. Um, you know, I, I watched it being built and you know I'm comfortable with that. <clears throat> what they what they neglected to notice is that that data center that they were very proud of. They had spent a lot of money and gotten proper cooling and, and all the things you need. Um, what they hadn't noticed is basically three of the walls were, you know, quite safe. There was a fourth wall that was accessible kind of only through a closet, but the closet was easy to get to. If you got into the back of that closet, the fourth wall was only drywall and you could Kool-Aid man style <laughs> just if you wanted to bust through the drywall, take some servers and leave. Now, nobody ever did that, but it was an important thing to discuss to kind of underscore the point where they, you know, were very satisfied with their level of physical control and security. But there were things they hadn't thought about. Uh, so if this is, you know, th this again can be a pro. Like I said, I have customers where cloud deployment for certain things, absolutely not an option for them. Um, because they're required to control these servers on site. But you may work at a company or have some customers where they, this is just kind of a hang up for them. Well, I've built this out and, and I trust the security because because I hired it, because I set it up. I don't know what the cloud providers do. And there may be some gaps in that security that they've thought of. Uh, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. Another pro. Um, if you need your data to be accessible, even when all the, the external telecom is down, um, having things on-prem is important. So I had a customer once, they were in uh, Northern Africa, and they it wasn't reliably scheduled, but they were aware that for roughly eight hours every work week, they would lose their connection to the outside world. There would also be power issues too. Uh, they managed uh, a lot of billing for European uh, cell providers. And so, you know, kind of every minute of downtime in a way was critical to them because there were, you know, billing statements not going out while they were down. So putting their data and applications in the cloud 
was not a legitimate option for them because they could not risk that six to eight hours of everybody sitting around waiting for the telecom to come back. So all of their data, you know, as they would ingest that data from the different providers, it all lived on-prem. So when they lost their connection to the outside world and when they lost power as well, they could be up on generator power and they could continue working. So that that's a definite pro. You know, if you live in an area where, um, or if you're, company has a data center in an area where the internet connection is dicey, um, having your data on-prem can be good because you can continue accessing it and working uh, even if your connection to the outside world gets a little flaky. Um, another pro of putting things on-prem is licensing. Um, licensing, as we all know, anything to do with SQL Server is very complicated. Um, it's fluid. It changes quite a bit. Um, in my experience, it is easier to have the licensing conversation when the licenses are on-prem uh, rather than it, it just in the cloud. It can be complicated between the bring your own license and, you know, if you don't do that, then you're paying kind of a, a, a certain percentage of it when the server is up with a SQL server installation on it. Um, and then like managed instances make this more complicated even. Um, so in, in my experience, having the licensing conversation, especially with management, when the servers are on-prem, it's a little more straightforward. You're just talking, you know, here's the number of cores we're going to license and here's what you're going to do with it. Um, and then, you know, when you get out to Azure and, and things like that, it's, that's a, it's a more confusing conversation to have. So in my mind, um, the <laughs> licensing is never simple. But as simple as it gets is when you're talking about licensing cores on-prem. So let's talk about some cons. If you don't have all this stuff set up, um, the upfront investment to build a data center out is quite large. It requires a lot of infrastructure, honestly, that's easy to forget when you're putting together a budget for things like this. You know, it's easy to say, well, I need, you know, 20 servers and I need all the licenses to, to make those go. <clears throat> but what you forget is you need racks. You need to be able to cool those, cable them. There needs to be a connection to the outside world. You need to be able to put a fire out if one starts, all those sorts of things. Uh, depending on the uptime requirements, you know, for your business and your apps, you may actually be doing this twice. So you may be building out one data center or two um, or potentially even three. But, you know, that's another thing to keep in mind where if you don't have a robust infrastructure on prem and you're talking about deploying a lot of servers and if uptime is critical and things like that, you're talking about a significant amount of money to make this go. Um, another thing you need beyond all those things we just talked about is you need personnel. So, you know, you don't need, you don't need a resource per server or anything like that. But when you're talking about a complicated physical infrastructure, you're going to need uh, skilled employees to maintain that. And that's another thing from a budgetary standpoint. It can be easy to leave out. You know, if you're talking about, well, we need 50 servers, we need all the licenses for that. And we're going to buy a new rack and we're going to enhance our cooling to support this and all of that. It's really easy to leave out that potentially you're going to need to add another resource to keep those running. So what all this means is uh, even though I have a lot of friends in operations, and I certainly don't want them to lose their jobs, uh, from a resource perspective, putting things on-prem is more expensive because you're paying 100% of that person's time where, you know, obviously those people, when you talk about Azure, Amazon, things like that, you're paying for those resources, but you're paying a small percentage of that because they're managing not only your servers, but everybody else's. Um, if you're bringing a resource on to manage your servers internally on-prem, then they're dedicated just to you and you have to keep them busy. Um, so that, that can cost a, a fair amount. So what are some pros of being in the cloud? So again, we come back to cost. We talked about cost uh, from a different perspective on-prem. In the cloud, uh, 
the angle on, on cost is a little bit different and that you can buy only what you need. Um, you know, so you're, you don't, you know, it, it makes it easier. Like say you have a proof of concept or something you'd like to prove to your boss that you think will work. Um, in, in the on-prem world, you know, you're buying servers to do that. You're buying licenses for those servers to do whatever that is. So you're trying to get approval maybe for tens of thousands of dollars to get all that put in. And if it's something, if it is a POC, you know, there's some chance that it's not going to work. And that can be a difficult argument to make. A POC in the cloud, you can go to your boss and say, you know, what I need is two weeks of two Azure VMs, or I need, you know, Azure SQL database for two weeks and something else, and then I can turn it all off. You know, so you're kind of, in a sense, really only you're paying rent for what you need, and then you can turn it off. So that that's attractive, not only from a scaling standpoint, but like I said, if there's things you're doing as a proof of concept or as a trial or something like that, um, that can be a compelling argument. As we all know, um, one of the huge pros of putting anything out in the cloud is scalability is quite easy. Um, On-prem scaling can be difficult. Generally, it means you're buying more stuff. Um, and that's certainly not instantaneous. You're not just flipping a switch. Uh, you know, you have to call a vendor and say, I need this many servers, and you have to integrate that into your environment and solution, and it's not straightforward. Uh, almost anything we'll talk about later when we talk about some of the deployment options to the cloud, the scalability is as easy as uh, maybe maybe a few clicks. Um, and then you, you get the power that, that you need within minutes instead of days. So that is obviously a really compelling argument. You know, if there's something where you don't have a good sense of, of the load of what you're trying to do, um, putting it out in, in the cloud makes a lot of sense because if you underestimate the capacity and power that you need, uh, you can get to it much more easily in the cloud than on-prem. <clears throat> the next point um, is probably not for every customer in every company, but if you need globally redundant storage, if you are, uh, and if, actually if you saw the past summit uh, keynote, they actually talked about this. If you are a, even if you're a large company, making your storage redundant around the world is very expensive and very technical. And you need, not only do you need excellent network infrastructure everywhere, um, but you're gonna need really skilled resources keeping that solution alive. Um, odds are it's something you've done customized for your environment. So you're, you know, pouring tons of money in, in, into something of limited use. If you need globally redundant storage in any of the cloud providers, it's as easy often as just a mouse click to say, yes, I need this. Um, now you do pay for that, but going back to the cost bullet point, uh, you know, what you're paying for to get globally redundant storage in, in the cloud is a fraction of what you'd be paying to have your own globally redundant storage solution. So if, if that's if that's a need for your company or your customer, um, that's a that's a real uh, that that that's a really high point of what the cloud offers us. Um, Going on from that, if you need your data available from all locations, again, that's something that's easy to achieve in in the cloud. On-prem is much more difficult. You know, it's very easy in the cloud to basically replicate your storage and your data all over the world so customers can access it from a region that's close to them. Um, in an on-prem world, that's a lot more challenging. Uh, one thing, so the, the bullet point about PaaS here, the first time I ever gave this talk, uh, I gave it to the local chapter in Washington, D.C. here. So there were a lot of U.S. government resources uh, that are a part of that group. And they highlighted something that was not originally part of the talk that said for a couple of the agencies that they worked for, <clears throat> um, Azure SQL database was the only authorized location for the deployment of new apps, which I found fascinating. And the reason it was is, um, you know, some of them worked for 
the defense part of the government and things like that. So obviously they had to pass a number of security audits and approvals uh, to even get permission to deploy anything. And there was pretty onerous security requirements as, as you might guess. And what that all meant is that Azure SQL database was the only database deployment location for a couple of those agencies that they were actually authorized to use. So I found that interesting and I like to highlight that point here. And we'll talk about this on, on the next slide where you know, there can be a perception that the security in the cloud is, is somehow less than what you have on-prem. Uh, not only is that not the case, in a lot of cases, the cloud providers have even surpassed what most companies can do on, on site. Um, and especially for government agencies and things like that, you know, it, deploying into a gov cloud might be their, their only option. This last point has, has an asterisk by it for a reason. So HA and DR are often built in the cloud solutions. And so you're doing less work to achieve the uptime that you need. That said, and the reason the asterisk is there, it doesn't happen by magic. Um, you still need to think through disaster scenarios and plan for those. Um, so that being built in doesn't mean, well, the cloud never goes down and I'm never gonna have a problem with this and I don't have to worry about it. What having data out in the cloud does is give you a lot of new tools and new ways to keep your data alive, um, but it's still a thought process you need to go through. You can't just say, well, we've deployed everything to Azure and Azure ne you know, never breaks, and so we don't have to worry about it. You still need to you know, kind of war game those scenarios out and think about, you know, do we need data spread across regions? Um, you know, how, how do we need to think through this? Because we can't just trust that this will never go down because inevitably something will. So what are some cons of putting things out in the cloud? So if your, if your internet connectivity <laughs> is a bit dodgy, uh, having things out in the cloud may not be the right answer for you. Uh, you do need robust internet connectivity to interact with cloud resources, especially if you're you know, pushing or pulling a significant amount of data. <clears throat> if that's not an option where you are, where your company is, uh, that's definitely a, a con. Uh, if you require the security of a VPN like an Azure or something like Express Route or something like that, um, that cost can be significant and is often overlooked when these things are being budgeted for. So you know, think about your security requirements, uh, your performance and if a VPN is necessary, make sure you budget that in because it's, it, it's you know, especially if you're talking something like Express Route or similar, uh, it's not just a few bucks a month. It, it can be hundreds. Um, if you want or if your manager wants, uh, you know, more control over the underlying infrastructure, then, uh, you know, th that's a negative. When you're deploying things out to Azure, you don't know anything about the boxes that it's on. Uh, you, you know, you, you know you're paying for certain type of storage, certain performance level of that storage, certain performance level from the processors, but you don't know anything physically about them. Uh, so if that, you know, if you're in an industry where you need to know that or, or you know, your manager is uncomfortable not knowing that, then that can be a real con here because you, you know, it's not like you can drive to, to an Azure data center and say, show me my 20 servers. Uh, it just doesn't work like that. Um, noisy neighbors. So I want to highlight that here. It's definitely better than in the early days of this stuff where the noisy neighbor issue um, was potentially quite large. Uh, but it is something to be aware of even now. So like if you provision in Azure IaaS VM, um, you know, you can design the storage in such a way and it will say, you know, it will give you up to say 5,000 IOPS or something like that. The reason it says up to is because that is a bit fluid. So like I said, they've, they've really done an excellent job of making sure that noisy neighbors don't ruin your experience. You know, there is a certain performance level somewhat guaranteed, but if you're supporting an application like I have in the past where even a variation of, of a tenth of a second 
in our transaction times uh, could potentially expose us to fines and things like that. You need to be very sure of the performance level you're getting. And when you're talking about, especially a cloud VM, you know, those IOPS are going to, they're going to vary a bit depending on what's going on on that server. There's a reason it doesn't say we guarantee exactly 5,000 IOPS. It says up to because those are fluid. So that's something to think about. And if you're operating in an environment where performance variation can get you in trouble, um, that noisy neighbor issue, as minor as it may be these days, still may be important. Um, another potential con is that you have to redesign your apps to deal with connection issues more efficiently. You know, a lot of times if you've deployed everything on-prem, the web server might, right be, might, might be right next to your database servers. And odds are connection issues are not something you're going to have to worry about. They're on, they're on the same fabric, all that stuff. Um, when you're talking about, you know, web servers and database servers out in the cloud, the connection is likely to be a little bit more variable. And so you need to design your app to handle that gracefully. Uh, we talked about the perception of lighter security earlier. I won't go into all the different uh, certifications that all the providers hold now, but safe to say uh, Azure, Amazon, Google are more highly certified from a security standpoint, odds are, than 99% of the on-prem data centers out there. So while, while it may have been true five or six years ago that security was not as tight, um, it, in my opinion, that's no longer the case, but we're still fighting that perception with management and things like that. You know, when you say, hey, we're going to go deploy this out to Azure, uh, some of the time what you'll get back is, oh, I heard that's not secure. So you have to deal with that perception. It's really not the reality anymore, but the perception is still very much there. The last point, and we've touched on this a couple times, is a real con to the cloud is things happen by magic. The perception is that it never goes down. Your data is never at risk. And I know I have designed solutions for customers that they then took away the HADR portions because they said, ah, we're putting this out in the cloud. It doesn't matter. Um, we're never going to have an issue. And that's, unfortunately, it, it kind of nudges you into some poor choices because, you know, high availability disaster recovery, like we talked about, you know, bad things can still happen, even if you're out in, in the cloud, but the, the perception is that they don't. And so, unfortunately, it kind of leads customers into making some poor decisions from that standpoint. So, I'll kind of briefly go through this. Um, these, these slides are really in here more for resources for you, um, as opposed to something we're going to talk through in great detail. Uh, what it does is it highlights kind of the, the GDPR-related tooling um, that the three major cloud providers have. Uh, so you can see here what Azure has to offer, AWS. Um, a lot of them comply with the same, um, the same standards. And so like I said, these are in here uh, more for your resources than anything we're going to talk through in great detail. What I will say from a GDPR perspective is that, in my opinion, the tooling that Azure offers, and I talk about some of that here, uh, compliance manager, data subject request portal, um, the, the tooling they give you makes handling GDPR requests and things around that, in my opinion, easier. So this talk is, is by no means a recommendation of one cloud provider over the other, but if, you know, if you're dealing with data in the EU um, and having to fulfill uh, GDPR requests and things like that, um, in my opinion, the tooling in Azure is superior to the other two. As of now, uh, just like anything else, they're very, you know, all the providers are very competitive with each other. So, you know, me saying this is the case now in a month, uh, perhaps that changes. So cloud on-prem or both? So what we're going to talk through in these next few slides is just kind of a, a comparison between the three cloud providers non-prem and kind of what you 
can be offered. Um, again, these slides are more for resources than discussion, so I'll just kind of lightly touch on these. Um, and I am curious to see in the chat window if anybody on the call uh, has to manage any Hadoop clusters. Um, if not, I'll probably just kind of gloss over that part. So if you're managing a Hadoop cluster, go ahead and throw something out in the chat and say yes. Uh, if I don't see any yeses, then I'll just very lightly touch on that. So SQL Server on an IaaS VM. Um, this is probably something we're all very comfortable with. Um, the, the, the behavior is almost identical to a machine that lives on-prem. Um, you know, obviously it's just, it's VM that lives somewhere else, but you're managing everything. You can fully control uh, configuration, maintenance, things like that. That's, that's the experience that we all know. Uh, so it's not really different except well, really the only difference is where the machine lives. Um, if you're dealing with any cloud data warehouse stuff, uh, Azure SQL DW is Microsoft's offering in the uh, MPP kind of cloud-based warehouse space. So it separates storage and compute. Um, you can pause the compute capacity when it's not needed. So this is very attractive. If you need to deploy a data warehouse, you're not sure of the scale. And a lot of times those warehouses, you know, they're under heavy load for a few hours a day while you're loading data. And then generally they don't need all that horsepower uh, while they're only being queried. So putting something like that out in the cloud can be attractive from a management standpoint because you're only paying for the power when you really need it. Um, Azure SQL DB is the PaaS flavor of SQL Server, like we've talked about, limited control of maintenance and configuration, but you also don't have to worry about patching and things like that. So there, there's some pros and cons there, uh, but that is the, that's the PaaS SQL Server offering from Microsoft. Um, I didn't see any responses about Hadoop, so it, we won't talk about that too much. I will highlight, so you'll see that column on the next two slides, three slides. Um, one thing I do want to touch on is that, uh, and you've seen this with SQL Server 2019, where Microsoft is really embracing HDFS and things like that. Um, and Polybase, which came to us in SQL Server 2016, and they've continued to enhance from that standpoint, um, allows you to connect to Hadoop file systems and things like that as very much an integrated part of the SQL Server experience. So even if you're not managing those, and we'll, we'll actually have a brief case study on that later, um, th those are resources that are pr pretty easy to interact with. So the Amazon equivalents of what we just talked about, so you see, and, and these columns line up across these slides. So SQL Server on EC2 is, is the IaaS offering in the Amazon world. Uh, the Amazon equivalent of Azure SQL D W is Amazon Redshift. Um, Amazon RDS is their PaaS offering. Now, Azure supports more than just SQL Server, and I believe they support Postgres as well. Um, RDS actually supports six different engines. So if you're in a shop where you're not just running SQL Server, you're running maybe a few different flavors of database engine, uh, Amazon's offering is, is a little friendlier to shops like that. So I would say that Google, uh, probably in their offerings, is maybe a little bit behind the other two. Um, and you, you can kind of see that from this slide. So SQL Server on GCP is their IaaS offering. It's, it's just like what we've talked about earlier. Um, from a data, from an MPP data warehouse perspective, so they do have Google BigQuery. My experience has been, and to a certain extent, this is true about all of them, but you need massive amounts of data for BigQuery to be essentially worth its price. Uh, so if you're dealing with petabytes of data, it's quite good. Um, most of us aren't. And so if, if you're not, though, you know, they do have an offering in that space, I would say BigQuery um, is, is probably a step beyond Redshift and Azure SQL DW. So there's not really an equivalent for smaller MPP data warehouses in, in the cloud. But BigQuery does exist. Uh, Google Cloud SQL is, is their past flavor of database engines. At this time, it does not support C, uh, SQL Server. So 
if you need a PaaS flavor of SQL Server, uh, Google's not going to be an option for you where Microsoft and Amazon are. And then lastly, um, these are kind of the on-prem equivalents of everything we just talked about. I will say, so I say in the in the PaaS space there, there's no on-prem equivalent of Azure SQL database. Uh, I'll talk about this at the end, but with Azure Stack, if you're willing to fork over a considerable amount of money to Dell or HP or, or a few other vendors, um, you can buy a massive box that you can bring in house that gives you your Azure experience locally. So there's no t true on-prem equivalent, but uh, with the release of Azure Stack servers, you can bring the Azure experience in-house. And for customers I have like in the financial world and things like that, um, that's that's a real game changer. You know, a lot of times they like the, the tooling and, and everything else around Azure. But like I said, they're living in a world where sometimes the contracts they sign require all the devices to be under their control. So they can bring that Azure experience in-house. So I would say probably that entry on this slide is not exactly true, but given what it costs, Azure Stack, um, bringing one of those boxes in-house is not an option for everybody. <clears throat> Pardon me. So another, um, another deployment option, and it's hard to say where exactly this fits, but this is kind of a segue into uh, hybrid deployment options. So I have this listed as an on-prem deployment option. Uh, if you have Azure Stack, that's true. If not, then you're dealing with cloud um, managed instances. So they've just gone GA here recently. So it's a new deployment model of Azure SQL database. It's, it's quite close to having um, on-prem enterprise edition features, uh, excluding like availability groups and things like that. But you have all that out in, in the cloud. So you have all the things you like about past automatic patching, version updates, automated backups. To a certain extent, the high availability is automatic. Um, but you have that instance experience where uh, Azure SQL Database, you don't you don't have that. Um, so this this is a, a I wouldn't say a new option because managed instances have been around for about a year, uh, but it's just now gone GA where we all have access to it. So I wanted to throw that in here as well. <clears throat> and so now what we're going to talk about these are all things I've seen out at customer sites, and you can kind of think through whether or not these fit for the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, but what a lot of these are, are hybrid deployment options between on-prem and cloud. And that's, you know, I know we had some folks that said, oh yes, everything we have is out in, in the cloud. And there's definitely more and more of that. But um, most of what I see is what you're going to see on these next few slides where there there's a hybrid approach. You know, we have some things that live on-prem, but we want to embrace the cloud. And so I'm going to talk through a, a, a few things I've seen uh, that deal with ways to do that. So <clears throat> one of the more popular things I've seen, especially for dev teams and things like that, is they'll have the app servers on-prem. Generally, you've got a robust process set up around deploying and managing those. But especially for a development team, you know, they may not want to engage the database team. The, the DBA team may be short on resources. So this kind of approach can be a good choice in that you can just spin up a database to store the data that you need and you can interact with it as you wish. The devs don't have to manage it. Nobody's installing it, backing it up, anything like that. That's all happening automatically. And you can you know, spin, spin the horsepower up and down as you need it. Um, so it's a really good option. You know, if you've got, like I said, robust processes around development and operations with your web servers, and the database team is either non-existent or quite small. Um, another, and I actually have kind of a brief story about this. I am seeing more and more customers um, scale their availability groups out with adding an Azure replica. So I actually had a customer who uh, they were on the cusp of signing a fairly large deal with a customer. That particular customer required um, that data centers for their partners be 400 miles apart for uh, disaster recovery reasons. 
um, my customer, their data centers, we're only about 90 miles apart and on uh, opposing sides of a large river here in the States that flooded quite often. So the, the customer, while they love the product, they love everything about it, they were deeply uncomfortable with the, <laughs> with where the servers lived. And that was holding up a, a multi-million dollar deal. And so I, I happened to be at the customer site uh, working on some other issues, didn't have anything to do with this, but they came to me and said, listen, you know, we basically have this large sales deal hung up because our infrastructure you know, was technically on-prem. They worked with a data center partner, so it wasn't buildings they owned, but, you know, there was physical stuff. Um, you know, it was not meeting the requirements that their customer had. You know, the, the two data centers were 90 miles apart. It was not financially feasible to go build out a third one. And so they came and said, what can we do? I said, well, they were using availability groups um, for all, all kinds of stuff. And they were pretty mature uh, in their approach to that. I said, you know, if you scale this out, like they, they were in kind of the eastern part of, uh, of the U.S. I said, you know, if you add an Azure replica in, say, the U.S. West region, you're going to meet your customer's requirement, give you an additional bit of HA. Um, and, you know, and then you can sign that deal. And, and that's what they did. So <clears throat> obviously the network infrastructure to make that go is significant. But if, um, you know, if you need that scalability for HA reasons, for data center proximity reasons, whatever, uh, that's something I've actually worked on and seen and it, it works very well. <clears throat> um, I know replication is not, maybe the most attractive thing uh you know everybody that works with it certainly has their horror stories but in terms of uh, deploying things into the cloud or kind of migrating data out there it is a tried and true way to get that data out um, and it's it, it's a good way if you're wishing to kind of dip your toe in the water of deploying things to the cloud that's the way to do it um, it's not fun <laughs> it's not always great uh, but it like I said, it's tried and true. It's been around a long time. It's been around longer in the SQL Server world than anything else we've talked about. And so if you're looking for ways to start migrating data out there or kind of dip your toe in, into the cloud waters, replication is a great way to do it. Um, so now when I give this talk, and it's a 75-minute slot, uh, you're going to see a demo here. And I know we just have a couple minutes left. Um, if I have a way to – so I'll provide – these slides and when I do that I'll send uh, screenshots of the demo so you can kind of walk through what you would have seen in a 75 minute session so I have the slide here as a placeholder so when you're reading these later uh, you can flip over to the demo screenshots at that point um, so a couple other hybrid deployment options and scenarios so log shipping again not particularly attractive but a very easy way to begin the data migration journey. If you're starting to put things out into to the cloud, um, log shipping is one way to do it. Setup is straightforward, easy to configure, easy to monitor. You don't need a cluster, all that stuff. It's, it, it's a way to get some data out into the cloud and start playing with it there. And finally, um, and, this, and I, this actually leads into our first case study, is uh, Polybase connected to Azure Blob Storage. Maybe not something that as a bunch of DBAs we immediately think of, but you know, from SQL Server 2016 and onwards, our ability to connect to different data sources in SQL Server is greatly enhanced. And so that does lead nicely into our case study. So I went to a customer and basically what, the, what they do, they're um, here in the States, we have these metropolitan transportation planning agencies. And so what they do is they had, a, you know, proprietary stat software that projected um, traffic patterns, uh, patterns of where people would live in 5, 10, 20 years and all that. Um, and that, you know, decisions were made as far as uh, adding lanes to roads, building new roads, all that sort of thing. Those decisions were made as a result of what that software output. Um, essentially, they made a mistake. They their model showed that a bunch of people would move to this part of their metropolitan area. And so a highway was widened 
um, the part of the U.S. that they were in, that was a big deal. Lots of environmental concerns and all that. They were wrong. Nobody really used the new part of, of the road. And so there were some laws passed where they needed to be able to go back and look at their models and predictions and provide those to government auditors and things like that. And so what, long story short, because I know we're short on time, they were outputting terabytes of basically text files. This, this would output CSVs and JSON, um, and they were storing them in relational tables to meet the law. But obviously, that was requiring constant maintenance, all, all the issues you'd think you'd have with index maintenance and things like that. Um, I was out there just for a server health check, and they were battling this. And they said, you know, what, what, what can we do to fix this? Because we don't, you know, we're calling our storage vendor every three months adding storage. So what we ended up trying is we loaded those output files out into the cold tier of Azure Blob storage and said, you know, you can use Polybase, connect to it, query it like a table, but it doesn't live here. Um, the only, so they had a set of queries that ran. The only real rule was those had to execute in less than 30 seconds. They executed in about 15 on, on prem. Uh, when we put it out on the cold tier of blob storage, the queries actually ran in 11 or 12 seconds. They went faster. As the final bullet says, their storage costs went down by 96% year over year. Blob storage, very cheap. On-prem storage, not, not cheap. And so here's where the demo of that would be. Like I said, when I upload all these, um, you'll have the ability to go through screenshots of that. Um, I'll skip largely over this one, because I know we don't have a lot of uh, Hadoop users. But one thing I want to note here is that this, uh, a lot of times I'll see uh, if I have customers using Hadoop that's out in the cloud because the deployment management is easier out there. This customer actually turned that on their head. They hosted all of their HDFS stuff. Their SQL Server stuff was all cloud-based. So let's wrap this up. Um, like we talked about, the cloud is just somebody else's computer that lives somewhere else. It's not magic, even though it kind of seems like it. Uh, the, you know, we talked about Google, Amazon, Azure, um, the competition with these providers is really good for us. We're getting all kinds of cool tools and options and, and new ways to solve old problems that we have. So this is, this is all good stuff. Um, you know, we talked about being maybe locked into deployment locations for certain platforms. So as you're deploying things, think about if you're just doing it because it's the way you've always done it. Or, you know, we talked about those lists of pros and cons. Are, are we deploying things in the cloud or on-prem for the right reasons? Uh, we talked a lot about hybrid approaches. That may or may not be the right answer. You may want to go exclusively cloud or on-prem, but, you know, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, like we talked about. And then last slide, um, set expectations. And that's really twofold. So with managers, it's important to set their expectations. The cloud is not magic. You still need HA, DR. You need to pay for some stuff to make that more robust. You need to plan for it. Set the expectations within the team as well. I go a lot of places where the junior DBAs are like, ah, I don't ever worry about this stuff out in Azure because it just runs. So they don't, you know, they don't back it up. They don't, they don't go look at it, things like that. So make sure you've set the expectations with the team on, on, uh, how you handle your stuff that lives in in the cloud. Uh, we've talked a few times that Hater is not done by magic. It's just different here. We have some other options available to us. You still need to think through you know, what a disaster scenario looks like and, and how you'd want to handle that. Stay abreast of all this stuff. It's hard because there's so many things coming out day by day even. Um, if you have the ability to access training like this, free events are awesome, but there's, you know, there's a lot of resources to keep up with all this. Um, we talked about Azure Stack and embrace all this. This is a fun time to be doing what we do. There's a lot of cool stuff that we get to play with. Uh, and hopefully this talk has, has kind of helped open your eyes to some of the ways that we might use that. Um, here's some other ways to contact me, Twitter, email, blog. Other than that, I'm all done. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, uh, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I, I have a few slides to show, and then we can have the Q&A. Okay. All right. Uh, 
So everyone, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but uh, uh, I think in, in Matt's uh, place, it's around 5.30 now. And he started this webinar at 4.30. I think it's really kind of him for him to spend all this time for the community. Uh, so thank you, Matt, on behalf of the team and the community. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, so let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can, uh, after this webinar, you can join our Facebook groups, the LinkedIn groups and on Telegram. Uh, I think Satya has already put them, put them down on the chat window and he'll put them down again. And a word from our sponsors, the SQL Maestro is, uh, like I said, uh, we offer a lot of advanced trainings on SQL Server and Microsoft Data Platform. So you can check that out out uh, at sqlmaestros.com and not the hands-on labs. Uh, you can check them on-site training and SQL Server Health Check. If you have any queries regarding SQL Maestros, the trainings, uh, you can write us at classes at sqlmaestros.com. So we are coming up with uh, new online masterclasses where we have tied up with some of the world's best trainers uh, to take uh, eight hour classes. Each session in masterclass will be eight hours, which will be taken uh, four hours each day. So I'm sure you know some of them already, Hamish Watson, Andy Leonard, Greg Lowe, and more to come. So you, uh, these are the contact details. You can contact uh, our team anytime. So the HOLs, hands-on labs, which are self-paced online learning. Uh, since you are a DPG member, you can already access some of our free demos to see how it all works, and then you can uh, register for it. That's it. Uh, thank you all for your time. Hope it was worth each and everyone's time. And uh, thank you, Matt. And then we have the YouTube channels where we upload our, our, our DPG webinars. So even today's webinar will be uh, uploaded uh, in you know weeks time. So you can always subscribe to that channel and you can up, uh, be updated with the latest webinars. Uh, visit our official uh, uh, website that is dataplatformgeeks.com. And uh, don't forget uh, to join our groups. And one of the most important things uh, is the feedback. So we have already posted on Facebook and LinkedIn. So I will put down the links. So go ahead and uh, uh, give us the feedback uh, regarding this webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Over to you, Matt. Okay, uh, were there any questions? Yeah, I, I didn't see any. Uh, I've responded to a couple in chat. I didn't actually see. Ah, so yeah, it looks like the only question in the Q&A is when will it be available on YouTube? You said that would be about a